Thank you. Uh, it's really an honor and a pleasure to be here today again uh, to present some of the new data that we have on Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia. So many of you know already very well Waldenstrom is a disease that was described back in 1944 by Jan Waldenstrom when he described two cases of patients who had lymphadenopathy, uh, splenomegaly, but also had hyperviscosity, and he described that IgM protein that they had in the peripheral blood. We know that this is a lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma that has two characteristics, the presence of lymphoplasmacytic cells in the bone marrow and the presence of an IgM protein in the blood. And soon enough, probably we will have to add one more thing, which is the mid-88 mutation that I will talk to you about um, in the next few slides. But maybe these will definitely characterize for us patients with Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia. Now, Waldenstrom is a disease just like multiple myeloma that progresses very slowly with early asymptomatic cases of monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, IgM MGUS, followed by smoldering Waldenstrom, and then finally when patients have symptomatic disease, we treat those patients. And most of the symptoms that patients have with Waldenstrom are related to either the high levels of IgM protein, so the hyperviscosity, headaches, blurring of vision, nosebleeds, retinal hemorrhage, as you see, or the presence of bone marrow infiltration, which is usually characterized by the anemia, thrombocytopenia, and leukopenia. Now, unlike other diseases, Waldenstrom can also have specific characteristics. For example, the IgM can go and attack the nerves in many patients and cause neuropathy. It can be characterized by having patients with cryoglobulinemia. As you can see here, one of the uh, cases of cryoglobulins that can really uh, lead to acrocyanosis. We can also see patients with CNS involvement, and that's called the bing neal syndrome. And we can also see pulmonary infiltrates uh, when we see our patients with shortness of breath, and you can uh, do further uh, diagnostic studies. You sometimes see the presence of lymphoplasmacytic cells in the lung in those patients. In rare cases, we see renal involvement or lytic lesions. I know that sometimes there are publications saying there are no lytic lesions in Waldenstrom. The, that actually is not true. We do see some rare cases with lytic lesions in Waldenstrom. Now, if we go back to the biology and try to understand what is so special about this Waldenstrom other than being a low-grade lymphoma, we know that there is a, during the B cell development and going through the germinal center, the cells that are characterizing Waldenstrom are the ones that have already gone, uh, undergone, um, uh, uh, have not undergone, sorry, class switching, so they're stuck in the IgM protein part and have not differentiated to plasma cells. Now, in, in uh, the presence of cytogenetics and fish, we found that 30 to 50 percent of the patients have a 6Q deletion by fish. And we know that BLIMP, which is a tumor suppressor, is present on 6Q, and we think it may play a big role in the pathogenesis of Waldenstrom. Now, all of these studies were done before the era of whole genome sequencing and whole exome sequencing, and you've heard already in, uh, by multiple speakers about sequencing and how it has changed the progress that we have with B-cell malignancies. And if we have one example of this, it's actually Waldenstrom, where whole genome sequencing as well as whole exome sequencing in 30 patients was presented by Steve Trion in the New England Journal of Medicine paper last year that showed that over 90 percent of the patients had a mutation a somatic mutation in mid-88. Now, what he hasn't shown also in that paper, and it's being studied now, is that also 20 percent of the patients had a chemokine receptor mutation called CXCR4, and that's being studied right now, and I'll show you some data of that. Now, here is some of that data where there is this uh, C2G uh, uh, change. Uh, leading to a mid-88 mutation of L265P, and this somatic mutation leads to activation of this pathway, leading to activation of ERK, PI3 kinase, and NF-kappa-B pathway. Now, further studies were done by many other groups, indeed confirming the presence of mid-88 mutation in many patients with Waldenstrom and not being present in myeloma or other B-cell malignancies and it's also present in early diseases, in IgM MGUS, indicating that this is not a mutation that leads to uh, proliferation or uh, worse prognosis. In fact, most of those patients did not have any difference in their prognosis when they had the mid-88 mutation. So all of those studies you can see from the Italians, from the French groups, uh, from the Mayo Clinic, and many others have shown us that indeed mid-88 mutation is present between 70 percent to about 90 percent or so of patients with Waldenstrom.
Now, how about that other 20% of patients who have this CXCR4 mutation? Uh, my lab has been very interested in CXCR4, which is a chemokine receptor that targets cell trafficking and cell dissemination. And we asked the question, is that small subgroup of patients with Waldenstrom who have this mutation, are those the ones who have a worse prognosis? Is this the mutation that leads to progression from an IgM MGUS area to a uh, an, uh, further event of symptomatic disease? And can we target this with specific drugs that act on CXCR4? Now, we know that CXCR4 is a chemokine receptor present on many cells, including stem cells. And in fact, we use drugs that affect CXCR4 right now, which is plerixophore that we use for stem cell mobilization. So now we have a malignancy that is characterized by a mutation in CXCR4. It also regulates the BTK receptor, and this is where ibrutinib works very well, not only uh, for Waldestrom, but for many other B cell malignancies. So we went on to characterize the mutation in multiple patients, and you can see this is unpublished data where we've looked at Waldestrom, IgM, MGUS, and many other lymphomas, including large cell lymphoma, splenic marginal zone lymphoma, and hairy cell leukemia. And this was work done with the Spanish group, with Jesus San Miguel group. And indeed, we found that 28% of patients with Waldestrom do indeed have a CXCR4 C1013G mutation, which is present in the WIM syndrome. And this usually characterizes patients who have a hyperactivation of CXCR4, leading to it to actually disseminate uh, and not sit in the bone marrow for a long time. So it actually f factors into cell dissemination. This mutation was not present in other B cell malignancies, including myeloma, IgA, or IgG, MGUS, and not even in li other lymphoplasmacytic lymphomas that are not IgM. Now, what we did is we took that mutation and we've done some in vivo studies in mice to see, does, is it really a functional mutation or not? So we first overexpressed CXCR4 to see a gain of function. And indeed, when we put those cells into the mice, we find a much faster dissemination of the Waldenstrom cells that have a higher level of CXCR4. They grow much faster in the bone marrow, liver, and spleen. And as you can see here by immunohistochemistry of the bone marrow, the ones that had a, a higher level of CXCR4 had a much more aggressive disease compared to the uh, regular level of CXCR4. We then further induced the mutation into the Waldenstrom cells. And as you can see here, this is the PCR level, um, as well as uh, the sequencing to see the uh, mutation of C1013G in those Waldenstrom cells. And when you induce the mutation, you put them in vivo again into the mice. And now not only we see a more aggressive disease, but we also see it going to extra medullary sites. We see it going to not just the spleen and liver and bone marrow in a more aggressive way and a higher mortality of those mice, but it also goes to other areas like lung and kidney. And indeed, it may explain some of those patients who have lung involvement with Waldenstrom and actually some patients who have renal insufficiency or involvement in their kidneys by Waldenstrom cells. So by that definition, a Waldenstrom cell that has a higher level of CXCR4 is a much more aggressive cell, and it leads to worse survival in our mice experiments. When we did gene expression profiling to look at the genes that are changing due to that mutation of CXCR4, and then you analyze it by gene set uh, enrichment analysis, GSEA, which is from the Broad Institute, you indeed find genes that are related to invasiveness, metastasis, as well as increased proliferation that all lead to this activation of pathways downstream of CXCR4. These include PI3 kinase pathway, MAP kinase, and NF-kappa-B. And I'll come to that because it's important as far as therapy related to those drugs. Now, what we've done is, uh, other than those pathways, there is specific drugs that work on CXCR4. One of those is AMD3100, or plerixophore, which is already FDA approved for stem cell mobilization in our patients with myeloma. But another drug that we're testing right now in myeloma and lymphoma is an antibody that's specific for CXCR4. This is from Bristol-Myers Squibb, and in the lab it's called MDX1338. In the clinic it's called BMS96564. 936564, sorry. And this drug, as a novel antibody, has been tested already in clinical trials, but we tested here in our mice in those that have already the mutation of CXCR4. And as you can see here by immunohistochemistry again, the mice that were treated with single agent antibody had a significant resolution of their Waldenstrom cells. It wasn't a complete cure, but it was an almost uh, complete remission in those mice, indicating that indeed with one antibody in a Waldenstrom cell, 
that has a one mutation, you could potentially significantly inhibit this tumor progression. Now, remember that those Waldenstrom cell lines already have the mid-88 mutation, so even in the presence of a mid-88 mutation, you can overcome it with an antibody to CXCR4. We're hoping to bring this, tri this drug into the clinic for Waldenstrom patients who have the mid-88 mutation very soon. Now, we know that genetics do not explain everything. Otherwise, twins who have uh, the same genetics may also have the same disease, yet we know that they are very different. So we started to look at other factors, including epigenetics as well as the non-coding RNAs. And one of the non-coding RNAs are the microRNAs. And we've previously shown that by microRNA expression profiling, we found that microRNA 155, which is an oncomere, is very highly elevated in Waldenstrom cells. And indeed, this is also present in CLL, I know that the Mayo Clinic group has shown recently that near 155 can be used as a prognostic marker in the peripheral blood of patients with CLL. And we've shown very similar results in the peripheral <coughs> blood of patients with Waldestrom. Now, why would you care about MIR-155? Not only as a prognostic marker, but because we can actually develop it as a therapy. And this is a whole new area of development of therapeutics for microRNAs. Now, we know that microRNAs could be very important because you can target one specific R microRNA with one drug. And because one microRNA can target multiple genes at the same time, so you can overcome that problem of one signaling pathway that you see with just other therapeutic agents that we have as small molecules. And here is a FAM labeled lock nucleic acid microRNA that we've developed uh, in collaboration with Santaris at Denmark and now with Exicon, where you can actually fluorescently label it, put it into the mice, and you find that indeed it goes into the bone marrow and into the liver and spleen of those mice. And when you use that, you can see that there is a higher level of that lock nucleic acid in liver, spleen, and bone marrow of our mice. Now, it can also go and attack those Waldenstrom cells, as you can hear by you can see by immunofluorescence. In red are the Waldenstrom cells. In green are the lock nucleic acid microRNA that goes inside those cells. And as you can merge it, you can see that indeed they go inside those Waldenstrom cells and induce cell death. So potentially in the future, you can take your patients who have a high level of MIR-155, whether it's CLL, Waldenstrom, or other lymphomas, measure their level in their blood, and then give them a personalized medicine, a personalized therapy with MIR-155 as a therapy. Here's the treatment part where you can see by bioluminescence in those mice, the Waldenstrom cells are increasing and you have a higher level of bioluminescence. And when you use the drug, there is less tumor growth and a better control of those Waldenstrom cells. Now, this is all biology and all in the lab and all potential future drugs, but what do we have right now today in the clinic? And you know that the consensus recommendations for Waldenstrom indicate that we should use still agents that are uh, used in many other lymphomas, including rituxin single agent, rituxin cytoxin combinations, whether it's RCHOP, RCVP, RCD, or nucleoside analogs, as well as other alkylators. In the salvage therapy, we've used also bortezomib, and I'll talk about other proteasome inhibitors. And then, of course, in the old days, we used to use elituzumab, and in some patients, we use stem cell transplant. So what's new in clinical trials in Waldenstrom? Here's all the studies that have been done with rituxin or rituxin combinations in patients with Waldenstrom. And as you can see, when we use single agent rituxin, four doses or eight doses, we get about a response rate of 30 to 50% in those patients. When you add cytoxin to it, or when you add fludarabine, you increase the response rate to about 90%, but the complete remission rate stays around five to 10%. In fact, the only study that showed a higher complete remission rate was the one that had a bortezomib rituxin dexamethasone combination up front, which is the BDR study, indicating that proteasome inhibitors could potentially be very useful in the treatment of this disease in combination with rituxin and steroids. Now, we know that bendamustine has come to play a big role in Waldestrom, and in the last few years, we've seen many studies, including this one, that shows a 90% response rate, but again, the complete remission rate in patients receiving benda rituxin are still very low. So we still need to do much better in our complete remission rate in patients with Waldestrom. Now, what's new? 
what are the hot topics. Of course, BTK inhibition, ibrutinib, and I'll talk about the data uh, from Steve Trion's phase two trial, as well as PI3K mTOR inhibition. You've heard already why this pathway is important. It's downstream of mid-88, which is mutated, and it's downstream of CXCR4, which is also mutated. And then epigenetic regulators like HDAC inhibitors and novel new proteasome in inhibitors or second generation proteasome inhibitors, including oprosimib and carfilzomib. Hopefully in the future, we will have very soon a clinical trial for a CXCR4 antibody for those patients who have the mutation, and hopefully MIRNA 155 inhibitors for patients who have a microRNA uh, 155 uh, high levels. So why ibrutinib? And you probably heard already multiple times about the BTK and how it's very important, the B-cell receptor and downstream BTK activation in many B-cell malignancies. And Waldenstrom is really one of them. And mid-88 can, uh, as a mutation, can also activate uh, or interact with the B-cell receptor and lead to activation of this uh, BTK. Now, in the, within the last year, we've seen for the very first time for Waldenstrom designation by the FDA for a breakthrough for ibrutinib in Waldenstrom. And this is based on the clinical data that I'll show you in the next few slides. But we're very excited because nothing has been FDA approved for Waldenstrom. And we're hoping that this will be the first step forward for approval for a drug in a rare disease like this. And here is the data of the phase two trial. This is the original data from the first 35 patients. This was expanded to over 60 patients now. And uh, the data was presented by Dr. Trion and Lugano last year, and this is some of it. As you can see, the median uh, prior lines of therapy in those patients was two, but many of those have had six prior lines of therapy. And many of those patients had a high risk by ISS staging system, including beta-2 microglobulin, bone marrow involvement, as well as splenomegaly and lymphadenopathy. Now, the side effects of single-agent ibrutinib is well known for many of you, and we know that it's an oral agent very well tolerated in most of our patients. And you can see, indeed, that grade 4 uh, side effects were very minimal, as well as grade 3 ones. The grade 2 side effects included neutropenia and thrombocytopenia, and in one or two patients, some bleeding episodes, which is well known for uh, patients that are receiving ibrutinib, as well as uh, one case of atrial fibrillation. Now, here is the response rate, again, in the first 35 patients, and this is expanded now to 60 patients. And you can see the very good, good partial remission, 90% reduction of the IgM protein occurred in four patients, or 11%. Partial response occurred in about 50% of the patients. Minimal response, which is a 25% reduction of the IgM protein, was in 17%, with an overall response rate, if you include the minimal response, of 83%, and if you include only partial response or better, of 66% in those patients. Single agent uh, in relapsed refractory, Waldenstrom. Now, ibrutinib attacks the BTK and attacks downstream signaling. How about other pathways, and can we have them interact with each other? And one of those is the PI3 kinase pathway. Now, PI3K itself is not mutated in Waldenstrom, but signaling from upstream with mid-88 or with CXCR4 and many other external stimuli will activate this pathway. Indeed, we've seen before in many cells that you take from our patients, you will have constitutive activation of this pathway in Waldenstrom cells. Now, the TORC1 inhibitors like rapamycin or everolimus or temsorolimus attack this uh, pathway downstream in that mTOR raptor area, which is TORC1. There is another pathway for mTOR, which is called TORC2. And this activates AKT. And it's an important pathway because if you only inhibit TORC1 by rapamycin or rapamycin analogs, you can actually have resistance by activating TORC2, and this activates AKT and activates the pathway again. So it's important to understand what are the dynamics of this pathway. And we know now that there are so many new drugs that not only affect TORC1 or TORC2 together, but also affect PI3K upstream and TORC1 downstream. And many of those are in development and in clinical trials right now. So what is the data of TORC1 inhibition in Waldenstrom? This is with the RAD001 or Everolimus. And when we did a clinical trial of single agent Everolimus in patients with Waldenstrom, and this was a collaboration with Mayo Clinic with uh, 50 patients originally, and now we have 60 patients on that trial with over five years of follow-up in those patients, we found that those patients had a 70% response rate, including 40% of them having a partial response, uh, and many of the other patients having stable disease or minimal response. Yes. 
And many of those patients indeed had lymphadenopathy improving as well as plenomegaly improving in them. Now, again, everolimus is a single agent oral well tolerated drug, and we've used it in maintenance therapy as well as in upfront therapy in many patients. But we did not achieve deep responses. So, with that in mind, we decided to add combinations between the drugs that we know very well, bortezomib and rituxin, where we tested them before, and everolimus. And we've looked at them preclinically, and there is synergistic activity. And then we took it uh, further into a clinical trial of a combination of three drugs, trying to mimic what happens in other lymphomas of three or four drug combinations to overcome resistance. So here is this data uh, that we're presenting now for three drug combination of everolimus, bortezomib, and rituxin. And again, this is unpublished data where we first started with a phase one trial and then we went on to the phase two trial. We have 46 patients on this current trial and the median age of this, these patients is 65. These are heavily pretreated patients. The median lines of prior therapy is five. Some of those patients had nine prior therapies and most of them have had rituxin before except one patient and almost all of, uh, half of them have received prior bortezomib. So even if they've received prior bortezomib and rituxin, many of those patients go on to this clinical trial. And as you can see, with the phase one part of those escalation, and many of those patients had only RAD and rituxin alone, we saw about a 78% response rate. In the phase two study where we have all of the patients receiving the same dose, we have an 83% response rate with a deep response in those patients, 60% of them having partial response or VGPR or a CR in those patients. So a deeper response compared to what we expect with single agents in those ones. Now, how about other PI3K inhibitors and mTOR inhibitors? We know that TORC1 alone is not good enough. We've actually tested the TORC1, TORC2 inhibitor from Millennium called MLN128, where we treat a few patients on a heme malignancy trial, and indeed we saw responses. This is also another very exciting drug, GS1101, which used to be called CAL101. And again, some, pre, uh, some uh, studies in hematological malignancies have shown indeed that in Waldenstrom patients, they're having responses. And this is a specific PI3K delta inhibitor. And many of those uh, drugs are ongoing now, whether it's CAL101 or GS1101 and other PI3K uh, delta inhibitors are ongoing. There is also PI3K mTOR inhibitors. BEZ235 was one of those, although it's not going on with clinical trials right now, but there are many PI3K mTOR dual inhibitors that are in uh, development right now for clinical trials in Waldenstrom. And then, again, the very exciting ones is the proteasome inhibitors. We know that bortezomib works very well for Waldenstrom, but we get a lot of neuropathy in our patients. To overcome that, there are now next-generation proteasome inhibitors. One of them is carfilzomib, but it's IV. And the other one is oprosomib, which is the oral drug. I, uh, we will be presenting in ASH the updates of the hematological malignancy phase one study of oprosomib in uh, these patients. And about 13 patients have uh, had Waldenstrom and were treated in it and have had very high responses. So look for the data in ASH. But carfilzomib has been tested in Waldenstrom in an upfront study, uh, which is carfilzomib, rituxin, and dex. That's called the CARD study. And this was done by Steve Trion, where we give them the combination of carfilzomib, rituxin, dex up front, followed by maintenance every two months with the same regimen. And in those patients, you can see that the overall response rate was 80%. Major responses of PR or better was, again, 64%. So deeper response compared to what we usually see with single agents. And in this case, now you have bone marrow involvement uh, getting better, lymphadenopathy getting better, and no neuropathy in those patients. Compared to bortezomib, where we had 50 or 60% of the patients having neuropathy, now we're seeing less or no neuropathy in our patients with the CARD study. We're hoping with the oral regimens, we will see the same thing with less toxicity and a much easier regimen for our patients with Waldenstrom. Now, how about histone deacetylase inhibitors? We've done preclinical studies showing, indeed, that epigenetic regulation is very important in Waldenstrom, and the interaction between microRNAs and histone deacetylases, where you have HDACs going up, which are the histone deacetylases, and HAT going down, and by targeting HDACs, histone deacetylases with an inhibitor, you can overcome resistance and induce cell death in those Waldenstrom cells. And indeed, by using LBH589 or panobinostat from Novartis, 
practice, we've done a clinical trial. It's an oral agent in a relapsed refractory population. And we found about a 50% response rate in those patients, including about 30% or so partial response or better, with, again, uh, oral agent, single agent in those patients. And here is the IgM response in those patients with penavinostat, and you can see many of those patients had indeed a significant IgM decrease uh, in their peripheral blood. So in summary, Waldistrom is no more what we used to say, let's try and take a little bit of lymphoma drugs or CLL drugs or myeloma drugs. Now, indeed, we have a specific uh, disease that have a specific pathogenesis with mutations of mid-88 and potentially in 20% of the patients mutation of CXCR4, where the pathways are getting to be well known, activation of the PI3 kinase pathway, activation of NF-kappa B. All of them are downstream of either the B-cell receptor, where you know now that ibrutinib works well, or the toll like receptor where mid-88 is activating, again, some of those pathways, and potentially we will be developing soon inhibitors either to mid-88 itself or IRAC, which is just downstream of mid-88. We know that canonical and non-canonical NF-kappa B pathways are very important and are activated either by the mid-88 mutation or by CXCR4 or by external stimuli, and novel proteasome inhibitors, not just bortezomib, but carfilzomib, oprosomib, MLN9708, many other new generation oral proteasome inhibitors are coming along to help the treatment of patients with Waldistrom. And then very exciting, of course, for us, CXCR4, which is a mutation in 20% of the patients, and we hope that the antibody with the clinical trials that we're designing now would show a benefit for those patients and overcome resistance. And then downstream, if you look at epigenetic regulation and non-coding RNAs, maybe in the future we'll have microRNA inhibitors, but we already have epigenetic regulators like HDAC inhibitors with penobinostat as the first generation, and there are new ones now that are being developed as HDAC6 inhibitors, which are very potent and less toxic compared to the pan HDAC inhibitors like panobinostat. So I think the future is very bright for Waldestrom. We're having many patients have improvement in their survival and less uh, uh, problems with toxicity, and we have many patients having really a chronic life that they live with the disease and not die from it. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge many people, of course, Ken Anderson, Steve Trion, Paul Richardson and Akil in our uh, in, uh, labs and in the clinic at Dana-Farber and many other clinicians. My lab team, this is our group in ASH last year, uh, were supported by the NIH, by the FDA, R01, by Leukemia Lymphoma Society, IWMF, and of course all our patients were very grateful for them. Thank you.